to be in Luke chapter 8. So if you have your Bible, open it up to Luke chapter 8. You can follow along in our verse-by-verse study. And let's go ahead and pray to open up, and then we'll go ahead and give a little background where we're coming from, and then we'll get into where we're going. And so, Heavenly Father, we just thank you tonight for this time in your word. And we pray that you would just speak through it, and you would speak to us, and that we would know you more, and just the things that you desired to communicate to the people in the first century, that you would, those same things you want to communicate to our hearts, and you want us to walk away uh, from this time knowing you more and having more practical things to work out in our lives. And so I pray that that would happen tonight, and we just bless our time in Jesus' name, amen. And so just as a reminder where we're coming from, Jesus, is, his ministry is is thriving. He's up in the Galilean area, which is up in the northern part of Israel around the Sea of Galilee. And he's been, um, just has like multitudes of people following him during this time. He's called the 12 apostles to follow him. We've seen miracles galore, dead people being raised, sick people being made well, the lame people walking, lepers healed, sinners set free, demon possessed, unpossessed, the <laughs> disciples being made and his ministry is just thriving at this time and the Jewish religious leaders they're there and they are just like steaming it's like every time Jesus comes and does something they have like steam coming out of their ears and um, they're they're jealous we're told and they're also at this time they're plotting on how they can kill Jesus they're trying to figure out a way to sort of silence him and get rid of him <clears throat> and so before we get into chapter 8, uh, one thing to know about this chapter, the bulk of this chapter really focuses on the Word of God. That's sort of the theme that carries through this chapter. And so <clears throat> as you go through it, you'll see how in the Jesus is going to go through a parable, and we'll talk about what a parable is. But in this parable... It's the theme of the parable is the word of God. But then when, as you move on from that parable, it, we get into these different accounts in this chapter of the, the disciples and Jesus going through a storm uh, of a demon possessed guy being healed. And all of the, the theme of these things is really still focused on the word of God through this chapter. And so that's sort of a big theme through this chapter. And so it says in verse eight, uh, now it came to pass, I'm sorry, chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their sustenance. And so Jesus, it says that in this first sentence, it says it came to pass. And when we see that in the Bible, it's always sort of a reminder to me that things always come to pass. And it doesn't matter what it is, what situation you're going through, what life is throwing at you, it always comes to pass in one way or another. Unfortunately, Many people commit suicide, and it's a permanent decision for something that would have come to pass. And it's, it's a temporary solution that people find a permanent, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And there's, there's a lot more that goes into that. But just something that always, when I see this word and these words in Scripture, it says it came to pass. It always comes to pass. And if we keep our eyes on Jesus as, as Christians, if we keep our eyes on Jesus, we can make this claim with surety that it will come to pass because no matter what, heaven is what we have to look forward to. It will come to pass. And so God doesn't always heal every person. He doesn't always work out every situation the way that we want it to. But if we have the idea and the reminder that we're taught in Scripture that everything is going through the, the Heavenly Father's filter and He's only allowing these things to, to transpire in our life for a purpose, then we recognize that it will come to pass. And so uh, 
time and then time with Jesus are great healers for every situation. And so that's what we find. And he's saying it came to pass afterward, after the the previous situation that we looked at where he was having dinner at the Pharisee's house and the, the sinful woman was there and or the, the former sinful woman was there and she was pouring out this this alabaster flask on his feet and her tears were falling and and so after that situation after it came to pass that he begins to go through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of god so he's going now it's still in the galilee area and some people some bible scholars believe that this is like a second tour through the Galilee area. The first time as he's going through, he hasn't called the 12 apostles yet, and there's various things that haven't happened. And this may be uh, like a second tour where he's already visited some of these towns and villages. Now he's making a second pass through these towns and villages to come and talk to these people to bring them to preaching and bringing glad tidings of the kingdom of God. So what what is preaching? And we hear the word often, it gets thrown around like every time you go to church, you say, oh, the preacher's preaching. But preaching really has a specific purpose. Preaching is the bringing the good news, bringing the gospel message that Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead and that your sin can be forgiven and that you can have eternal life, that heaven is, is a reality for the person that places their trust in Jesus. That is preaching. It's good news. So he's preaching bringing glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And it says the 12, that would be the 12 apostles were with him. And it's just an interesting thing that he's preaching and bringing glad tidings of the kingdom of God. That's the most important message that people can hear, that your sin can be forgiven. It doesn't matter what your background is. It just matters what you do going forward. God doesn't hold your past against you if you lay it at his feet and ask him to forgive you. He does. And it's that simple. And then he'll come into your life. That's good news. Your sin can be forgiven. The guilt that you carry around from being a sinner, even people who don't even believe in God don't realize that they're carrying guilt for bad things that they've done. Well, when God takes those away, he removes them, they're gone, and you're forgiven, and you have heaven to look forward to. That's good news. Right? And in, in our world, how many, how much do we need to, like, share good news with people right now because there's so much negativity going on. You can't watch TV. You can't look at social media without seeing just negative everything. Everybody's hating on everybody for everything. Well, how about some good news, right? And a couple weeks ago, I was, I was guest teaching in a, in a church and I taught from Philippians chapter four. And Paul says, if there's anything lovely, if there's anything of good report, if there's any, anything at all, just meditate on those things, right? The good things, right? And I, I brought up the, the situation. I, I'd seen this news story about a little girl who was five years old, and her, it sounds bad, but it's actually a good story. Her dad was having some kind of medical issue and trouble breathing, and she called 911, and they had the audio tape of her talking to the dispatcher, and, and she's, she's like, telling the dispatcher what's wrong and he's trying to tell her hold on and how's your dad and then she's asking her dad dad how are you are you okay can you breathe hold on they're going to be here soon and he ended up being okay she did a great job and it's just it's like a good story it made you feel good listening to this story like we need more good news we need to be able to meditate on good things but in particular we need to be able to meditate and think about the fact that god sent jesus to die for our sins so that we can be forgiven so that we can spend eternity in heaven. That's good news. That's the ultimate good news. And that's what people need to hear. And as Jesus was walking around, that's what he was sharing. Good news of the kingdom of God. It started out with repent, turn from your sin for the kingdom of God is at hand. But then he gives us hope of eternal life. Later on when the disciples are fearful because he's telling them he's going to go away. He says, let not your heart be troubled. And my father has, father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you can come too, right? I mean, it's, it's, he's full of good news. Think about the fact of these people as he's healing them and they're, they're being, 
their lives are being touched and changed. If you put yourself in first century Israel and you're walking around and you're hearing that Jesus is coming, that's good news. And then he comes and he delivers this powerful message of good news. And then he's backing it up but with people being healed and lives being changed. There's a, there's a God movement, a God thing happening, and we need more of that now. Now, I don't know if we could say now more than ever, but we could really use a lot of the good news to go around. And so notice it says, the 12 were with him, and it says certain women who had been healed of infirmities and evil spirits, then he names a few of them, Mary Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward and Susanna, and then it says many others who provided for him from their sustenance or their possessions. And I find it interesting, there's a few things that Jesus is ministering to women. And we think, well, what's so weird about that? In our culture, that's not a big thing. But in first century Jerusalem, Jewish rabbis and spiritual or religious leaders, they did not even teach women. They didn't, they consider women to be very low on the social pecking order, just maybe right above a slave. And so women, women were good for like breeding and that's about it. And so Jesus came and what did he do? (laughs) Sorry, I made my daughter giggle when I said breeding, but, uh, (laughs) but, or my wife too, but Jesus came on scene, and what did He do to women? He gave them equal status with men. He was willing to teach them. He was willing to reach out to them. He was willing to heal them and to cast demons out and to have lives changed. And as a result, these women want to follow and take care of Him and probably uh, some of His disciples that were close with Him with their own possessions. And I think that's such a great response of the heart to see that a life has been changed. And what do you want to do when, when you realize that it's God who's changed your life? He saved you from hell. All of a sudden, there's a desire to now want to turn and to serve and to do things for Him. And it doesn't always have to be money. In this case, they were just providing. They're maybe meal trains, right? Hey, can you make the meal on Monday? I'll make the meal on Tuesday. We'll take care of the boys while they're in town. However it went, we'll give them blankets. We'll make sure they got a nice place to sleep. Remember, Jesus was an itinerant preacher. He told one religious leader that, that said, oh, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, well, are you sure about that? I'm paraphrasing. But he said, are you sure about that? He said, I, foxes have holes. Birds have nests. But I don't even have a place to lay my head at night. You sure you want to follow me wherever I go? Right? And so they're providing those things that are needed. And I think that's such a, another great reminder for us is that God provides what we need. And there's a promise in Scripture that if we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that all these things, and in the context, it's all the things, food, water, shelter, He'll provide them for you. If you seek first the kingdom of God, all these things will be given to you. That's a promise. The problem that we have is that God provides for our needs when we want Him to provide for our greeds. Right? And so he provides what we need to survive. And we're like, well, that's not enough. I need more money or bigger house or bigger car or whatever. And it's, it's kind of a fascinating thing once you get outside of the United States, if you've ever traveled to a third world country and you've seen other Christians living, not in the same conditions that we have here to live in. And yet they're happy and they're filled with joy and they're happy to serve the Lord just where they are. And not everybody needs to be an American but everybody needs Jesus. And so another thing to note is that you've got this, this big dichotomy of people that are hanging out together. You've got Mary Magdalene, who apparently her life was a mess because she was, had seven demons that Jesus cast out. And a lot of people speculate that she was a prostitute or this or that. The Bible doesn't say that, so we don't really know. But you can sort of surmise by the fact that she had seven demons possessing her that she probably was in a bad way. You know, she was into some stuff. You could say that. And then also you have this this lady named Joanna. And it says that she is the wife of a guy named Chusa. And Chusa was Herod's steward. 
So Herod would be the, the ruler of the Roman area, and this lady is the wife of his steward. So you have somebody high on the social pecking order, also with somebody really low on the social pecking order, and yet with Jesus, he brings up people together. Jesus doesn't divide, he brings people together. And so uh, then Susanna, she's the one that came with the banjo on her knee. Oh, no, not her. <laughs> and many others who provided for him from their sustenance. And so as we move on to verse 4, and I'm trying to forget my bad joke, uh, it says, When a great multitude had gathered and they had come to him from every city, he, Jesus, spoke by a parable. And this is the parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and, some, and it was trampled down. And the birds of the air devoured it, and some fell on the rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so we get this parable. And so the first thing that we need to talk about is what is a parable? And a parable uh, means literally it's, it's made up from two Greek words. I think it's para, bolo, and bolo means to cast, and para or para means to alongside. So a parable literally means to cast alongside or to place alongside. And in this case, Jesus is taking one thing that they're familiar with, farming, and he's placing it next to a spiritual application. So you have farming in, the, in our sort of earthly realm, and then you have a spiritually understanding, and, which is how the heart receives God's Word. And so parables have also been defined as an earthly story that have a heavenly meaning. It's meant to reveal something to one group and to conceal something from another group. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But generally, a parable teaches one main point. It's not every little word has some deep, intricate meaning. Uh, they're not to be confused with allegory. In allegory, you're supposed to read it, and you can sort of take different parts of that story, and you can interpret it to mean all these different things. Parables aren't like that. When you read them, there's generally one interpretation of that parable. It has one meaning, one theme, one point. And in this case, I'm just going to give it away. The point is, and Jesus talks about it, but it's, again, it's how does the Word of God hit the heart of man? What condition is the heart in when the Word of God hits it? And oftentimes we struggle to understand parables in the Bible because they're teaching something spiritual from a common practice of the day. And so our problem is, is that we are not from uh, an agrarian culture 2,000 years ago, so these things don't always make sense to us as they would to those people in the first century. They'd be like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about. And so sometimes it takes a little bit of deciphering to figure that out. And in this, this case of this parable, Jesus really helps us out because he gives us the understanding of the parable in a few verses. So there's some of them where he says it, but then the Bible doesn't really elaborate on what he's talking about. And then you have to try to interpret it by using other things that he's talked about and other parts of Scripture to interpret that parable. And so we're also going to talk a little bit about that. I hope it doesn't get too heady and like educational, but it's important for the understanding of the Scripture and, and the Word. And so verse 5, Jesus says that a sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. So in this culture, what they would do, sowing, if you don't notice, this is not like stitch, stitching something. It's, this is taking seed out of a bag and throwing it out onto the ground. You're sowing seed. Uh, they would sow the seed, and then they would plow it, and oftentimes you didn't know what type of soil you were plowing until after you had already sowed. I mean, you, did I say that right? You didn't know what kind of 
soil you sowed to until after you plowed. And so they wouldn't do the plowing until after they sow the seed. And then other times in that culture, the fields were divided by a path. And so that path was a heavily trafficked area. And then they would also divide the fields with rocks because before they could sow the seed they, and plow it, they had to get big rocks out of, the, out of the ground. So they would take the rocks out, move them to the side as a divider between the property lines. And so that will help as we read through this to understand that. And so in this parable, there is a seed that's being sown and he's going to talk about four different types of soils. And so what does all of that mean? Well, in a little bit, Jesus is going to tell us what that all means. And so that's like I said, this, is, this one's like a bonus of the parables. I love it because Jesus gives the understanding. It makes it so easy for us to understand. So he says in verse 6, Some of that soil fell on the rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell on thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. And when he said these things, he cried, or he kind of cried out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What does that mean? If you have ears to hear, like I'm, everybody hears, right? I mean... Well, maybe not everybody, but most people have ears. Let them hear. So does that mean if you don't have ears, you can't understand? No. It's the idea is to hear with understanding. How you hear what Jesus is saying. That's another thing about parables is parables are meant to be heard. They were a teacher was speaking them. You were to hear them and gather in. So how you hear that parable was important. And, and so... Jesus says, if you have ears to hear, let him hear. We, hear. we see this over and over again in the book of Revelation, that he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I think we can use that same sort of understanding. It's like, if you have your spiritual radar on, and you want to hear what God has to say, then tune in. And that's the idea he's going to talk about here in verse 9. It says, his disciples asked him, saying, what does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables that, seeing they may not see, he's quoting from Isaiah 6, and hearing they may not understand. And so you go, what, I don't, what is that about? Why is he like, want some people to hear and understand and some people not to understand? Is, is God like trying to trick us or like, what's the deal? And notice something important in verse 9. Who came to him and asked, what does this parable mean? The disciples. And a disciple is someone who is a close follower or another understanding of that word is a learner. And so Jesus is the teacher. The learners, the ones that want to understand, they come to the teacher and they say, what, what is this all about? We, we know what you're talking about. You're talking about farming. We get that. But there's something more to this that you're telling us. What does it mean? And I think that's a really important message for us to take away tonight is that God speaks to us through His Word. And when we read His Word, sometimes we can read it and be like, you know, okay, I got... Got to hurry up. I only got five minutes this morning. Okay. And read a few verses and then you're poof, out the door. And, and it's sort of like there's, you don't glean anything from that. But if you truly want to learn, you want to know what God has to say to you, you sit down with your Bible, you pray, and you say, God, I want to know what you have to say. I want to know what you're speaking to me. I just read those verses, and that, how does that apply to my life? And then you just kind of be quiet and let them and listen. Let them speak back to you. And, and that's what disciples do. And so in this case, it sort of gives an understanding of what's happening in verse 10, because he says, it's been given to you disciples to know the mysteries or the hidden truths of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it's given in parables that seeing 
They may not see and hearing. They may not understand. So remember, there was all these people around in Jesus' day who were seeing these miracles. They were hearing the teachings. And up to this point, this is the first one that Luke records for us anyway, up to this point, Jesus has been talking to them just straight. He's been saying straight, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? It's pretty simple. Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. He's got all these, these great teachings that he's been doing. Love your enemies. Pray for those who use you. He's been going on and on and on. And he's been doing miracles to back up who he says he is as the Messiah. And yet what's happening is that these religious leaders are coming there and they're questioning. They're not believing. They don't want to hear the truth. They should have known better than anybody that Jesus was on scene, that He was doing things that only the Messiah could do, according to what the Old Testament prophecies said. Remember, lepers are being healed, blind are seeing, lame are walking, deaf are hearing, dead are being raised to life, demons are being cast out. Those are all things prophesied that the Messiah would do, and the, the religious leaders are poo-pooing it all to the side. They're, they don't want to hear any of that. So Jesus begins to speak to them in parables. There's people there in the crowd. We read in John, he feeds the 5,000. And then he, and the next day he crosses over the Sea of Galilee. And when he lands on the other side, there's this huge crowd that meets him that had been there the day before when he fed the 5,000. And they want to make him king. Why? Because he's going to give them bread. They want to make him the bread king, so to speak. And that's not what Jesus was there for. And they, they, so he begins to, to speak to them, and he, he has this really interesting message about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and they all are like, what is this guy talking about? And they take off, and then he looks at his disciples, and he says, do you want to go too? And then Peter looks at him and says, where else will we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter wanted to understand. The disciples want to understand. The multitudes, they're like, eh, this doesn't make sense anymore. I'm out of here. Why is this guy talking to us about farming? We already know all this stuff. We've been farming our whole lives. My grandpa was a farmer. My dad's a farmer. I'm a farmer. What do I need to hear about farming for? I'm out of here. But then those who want to understand what's really being communicated, they stick around and they go, tell me, tell me what this means. How does this apply to my life? What does this mean to me? How, what should I be doing? And so that's, that's the understanding of Seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. The other thing I think is interesting as I was preparing for this study is that one, one Bible commentator brought up that if people hear and they don't understand, they haven't been explained to them, there's less eternal accountability. But if you've had it explained and you know what's being said, now you have that eternal accountability. You may face a stricter judgment because you understood, but you didn't do it. And so that's just an interesting concept. And potentially by speaking in parables, Jesus is, is being gracious towards these people who don't want to hear because he's not giving them eternal accountability. He could have spoken in a way that would have made everybody understand he's God. He could have just said, stop right there, don't go anywhere, you are going to understand this, and laid it out for them, and everybody would have been, oh, wow. But they wouldn't have had the choice either. And that's where, you know, there's this big debate, theological debate, do we have free will, or does, and we can choose to follow God, or has He chosen us and it's not even up to us at all? And the answer is yes. The Bible teaches both. God does give you free will. You do have the right to choose to not follow Him or to follow Him. But it also says that He chooses you. So which is it? It's both. That's what the Bible teaches, and that's what I'm going to teach. And it's good to know that God chose me. But it's also good to know that I have a choice. I can choose to not follow Jesus, and I can walk away and do what I want to do and never look back. But that doesn't mean that He didn't choose me. So if, there, if you have a question going in your mind tonight, well, am I chosen? Am I one of the, how do I know if I'm one of the chosen? I would just say this, then tonight choose. And then you'll know you were one of the chosen. Pretty simple. And so He goes on in verse 11. After they've asked, what does this parable mean? Jesus says, the parable is this. Now He's going to make it real simple. He's going to explain it. He says, the seed 
Remember verse uh, 5, it says, A sower went out to sow his seed. So Jesus tells us that the seed is the Word of God. It's God's Word. That's the seed. And what's interesting about seeds? What's interesting about seeds? They come in all shapes and sizes. I think one of the biggest seeds is a coconut. Right? And if, if you've ever planted seeds like grass or flowers, they're usually these little tiny seeds, and you see the picture on the little flower bag that you get at the at the store, and it has a picture of you know like a, a you know pansies or something, right? And and you decide, oh, I'm going to buy these seeds, and you they're these little tiny things. You can, how is that little thing going to look like the picture? Well, all the DNA is in the seed. And the, the DNA, the seed in and of itself is nothing spectacular. When, as a matter of fact, for germination to happen, that seed has to go into the ground. It has to die in order for it to grow. It has to gr die in order for it to live, which is kind of weird. Right? But that, that seed gets planted in the ground. The DNA is in that seed in order for that seed to grow up into whatever was on the package. Same with the Word of God. The power is in the seed. The power is in the Word of God. As the seed gets sown, and remember we're talking about conditions of the heart, so as the seed is sown into the hearts, when it lands in a good soil, then the DNA is in that seed in order to change your life. It's not, it's not preaching. I might be good. I might be bad. But it's the seed. It's the Word of God that changes people's lives. That's why it's so important for churches and pastors and Christians to use the Word of God when they're teaching, not to teach about social justice. Is that important? Sure. Is justice important? Sure. Is the issues going on in our society important? Sure. But they're not more important than looking at them through the lens of the seed of the Word of God. And when you start throwing the Word of God out there and that seed begins to go out, again, it's going to land in different types of soil, and it's going to have a different result. But nonetheless, you just keep throwing the seed out because the power, the DNA is in the seed. And it's interesting, too, that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he talks about, he's, he's talking about the resurrection of after you die, that you're resurrected into a, a heavenly body or an eternal body, a glorified body. But he says in order for that to happen, this body that he calls a seed, he says it has to be planted. It's got to die in order for your resurrected body to, to grow. And then you'll be able to whatever you're really meant to be. And as I was reading with, with a friend last night in 1 John, and it, it talks about that we don't know yet what we will be, but we know that one day we're going to be like Jesus and we have this hope and he who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure but we don't know exactly what it's going to be like what's our eternal body going to look like what, are we, what when we're going around heaven for all eternity i'm still going to be recognizable as me because the dna is all here but i might look a little bit different right? if i look at pictures of myself as a kid you could still recognize it's me but i look a lot different now even from when like i was like 20 years old, 21 years old, and I met my wife. I had hair on my head. I had more eyebrows up here. But as I've gotten older, the hair's gone somewhere. She says I was false advertising. Right? The, the hair from my eyebrows is sort of like, I don't know what happened to that either, if it's genetic or what. I didn't shave them. <laughs> but, but, it, but I look different than I did at one point. But if you put the pic, you, people that knew me, when I was 20 years old, even though I looked different and older, I got bags, I'm fatter, I had no hair, they could, they could still recognize me. But how much better our eternal, our glorified body is going to be totally different, but we're still going to know each other. We're still going to recognize each other. And so as we continue on through this, he says that the seed is the word of God. And then he talks about those by the wayside. So again, by verse 5, he said, the seed was sowed and some by fell, fell by the wayside. Well, the wayside is a path. It's a well-traveled path that got trampled down. And so some seed will get out there in that, 
that hard trampled down path and it's not really going to get down into the soil and have a chance to grow but because it's just sitting there on top it says that uh where'd i go the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts lest they should believe and be saved so in in verse 5 who was it that took away the seed it was the birds of the air the birds of the air swoop down as that seed gets thrown out. They're like, oh, sweet. The farmer's throwing seeds out. Birds come down, take that seed. It's never going to have a chance to grow. And, but Jesus is saying, hey, that's what, that's what the devil likes to do. He likes to come as, as the seed of the word of God is going out. He likes to come and just snatch that away. And unfortunately, that happens sometimes. We, you, can, you can go out and you can throw all the seed, but... Some people just don't want to hear. Some people don't care. Some people, you know, it's like they're so, it ties in with the last one, but they're, they're so consumed with everything else that that seed doesn't have a chance, you know, and it just snatched right away. It's not by accident that you go to a Bible study or you go to church, and right after church on the way home, all of a sudden there's this argument in the car and everybody's fighting, and you're like, forgot about what you just learned in church, that seed and snatched away. And so it says in verse 13, but the ones on the rock are the ones when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root who believe for a while in a time of temptation or testing or trial, they fall away. So back in verse six, it says some of the seed fell on the rock and it sprang up really quick, but then it withered away because it lacked moisture. And in Matthew's gospel, in the parallel account, it says because the, the sun came out and scorched it and it didn't have any root, so it withers away. And so the seed in the rocks, it, it might get in there and it might get a little water and it might be able to grow, but there's no dirt, there's no soil. It's just going to, the roots aren't going to have anywhere to take root in and then the sun comes out and it withers it because there's no, there's no root. There's nowhere for the root to go. And this is what happens to people. They come to church. They hear that their sin can be forgiven. They have an emotional experience. They may come forward. They raise their hand, whatever, and they get saved. And then they go home. And then they tell their girlfriend, hey, guess what happened? I went to church this morning. Why? I don't know. I just felt like I needed to go. And what, what happened at church? Well, I got saved. I'm going to start following Jesus now. You're going to what? Well, you're going to follow him without me. I'm out of here. And all of a sudden, there's this, this trial. There's this a temptation. Maybe in, it's not a relationship. Maybe it's something else. It's like financial trial or it's, it's what it can be in any number of things. But essentially, you go, wow. boy, ever since I, this whole Jesus thing in my life, I, all these problems, I, you know, I'm done with this. I'm out. And there was no root. There's no genuine root, and it withers away. And then he gives the next one. He says, Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, they go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of this life, and they bring no fruit to maturity. And so this can happen too, right? Now, I was... I was listening to something today and the, they were talking about this. I don't know how accurate it is because I'm not a farmer, but they said that to seed one acre of land that it would have taken like a 60 pound bag of seed for probably wheat or whatever they were doing here. But be, with that 60 pound bag of seed that you threw out into the acre of land that there was already millions of seed spores of weeds already in the soil. So then they begin to grow together. And what is what do the, the weeds and the thorns do? They begin to grab on and grow up and choke out the good crop that you want that's growing there. And if you've ever had a garden, you know that you have to spend so much time weeding the garden because you didn't have to plant the seeds or the weeds. Those seeds were already there. But in order for your, your plants to be healthy, You've got to spend a lot of time weeding that soil. You've got to spend time feeding the soil, watering the soil, and just caring and tending to that soil all the time. Otherwise, 
those weeds will come up and they will wrap around and they will choke out the good plant that you have that you want to grow. And Jesus says that those weeds, those thorns, and it's interesting that he uses thorns because that takes us all the way back to Genesis to the, the original sin with Adam. And as a result of Adam's sin, the ground was cursed so that thorns came up and they had to work hard in order to have produce and things like that. It, takes, it should take your mind all the way back there. It's part of the curse. But these thorns that come up, Jesus says, what are they? They're the cares of this life. Right? You, get, you get to working so much that you don't have time for the things of God. You get to uh, trying to earn so much money that you don't, or you have so much money that the things of God don't matter anymore. Or you're so busy with all of your friends and different things that you just don't have time for the Lord and for the things of God. And those things, which aren't all bad in and of themselves, what happens is they begin to choke out any good fruit that was, or any good seed that was starting to grow. And that's really easy. So it's, we have to be careful in our life because it's so easy to allow things to in that begin to choke out the fruit of what God wants to do in our life. And it's, it is a constant sort of weeding and feeding in our own life, in our own garden of our heart. And, you know, the last thing that we want to do is choke out what God wants to do in our lives. And I think the good thing is, is that if you find that to be the case, it's an easy fix. It's just coming back to Jesus and sort of like starting over again. I, I've let these things get in the way of my relationship with you. I don't want that to be anymore. And you begin to remove those weeds out of your life. And you begin to spend time with the Lord, allow more seed to be put on the soil of your heart. And then hopefully this is what happens. Verse 15, but the one that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and a good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. So again, the good heart, the good heart condition, the seed goes on to the, onto the soil and it begins to take root and it begins to grow upward. And then the ultimate goal for any plant is that it will bear fruit. If it's a flower plant, you want flowers. If it's a fruit tree, you want fruit. And it's a, such a lame analogy, but it's so appropriate, is if you've ever seen a grove of trees, and I, one time I lived in Central California, and there was orange groves everywhere. Like, I'm talking like oranges for days. And I never once looked out in that field, in that grove, and saw an orange tree grunting and striving to grow fruit. How did that orange tree grow fruit? Well, the branches just stayed attached to the vine, and then the fruit naturally produced. And that's what Jesus says in John chapter 15. If you abide in me, I will abide in you, and you will bear much fruit. So how do, we, how do we get this good condition of the soil? Number one, we've got to weed and feed. We've got to hear with understanding. But we've just got to spend time with Jesus. And if you spend time with Jesus, it's, everything else sort of takes care of itself because He's the most important thing. Our life should revolve around Jesus. Jesus shouldn't revolve around our life. Does that make sense? Our life should revolve around Jesus, not the other way. He shouldn't revolve around my life. Well, I've got time next Sunday, but then the following Sunday, well, I, I'm too busy for this, and I, you know, I, I really love my sleep, so I don't have time to get up and, and spend time in the Word, or, or I've got to go to bed early because I've got to get up and work that overtime shift or whatever, and I've been there. I'm speaking from experience, and it becomes so, everything becomes more important. You sort of put Jesus around your life instead of your life around Jesus. He's the most important thing. He should be the central figure in our life, the most important thing. Wherever He goes, I follow. And just hanging out, hanging in the vine, you will produce fruit is what He says. And 
I, it's an interesting verse to kind of cross-reference here, but Galatians chapter 6. It's actually a really good cross-reference, at least in my opinion. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, just like we're talking about, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And then check this out. And let us not grow weary while doing good. This is a temptation. I've been reading my Bible. I've been praying. I've been waking up early. I've been going to church. I've been hanging out with my Christian friends. I've been, you know, I've been listening to the, the Christian radio station. And, I, and like, I'm just not seeing any fruit yet. Well, look what it says. It says, don't grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap, if you do not lose heart. There's a season, right, for fruit. If you Again, if you know anything about agriculture, your, your lemon tree in your backyard doesn't grow lemons all year long. There's a season. It's, 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 Monsanto is the one who's producing fruit and vegetables all year round. You shouldn't be able to get a pineapple year round. You shouldn't be able to get tomatoes year round. They're seasonal in their natural habitat. They grow for a season and then they don't. And then the next, the farmer has to go in there and he has to prune those things. And then the next season, they grow back. So there's seasons like that in our lives spiritually. We pour, we put in, we put in, we put in. You wonder, when's the fruit ever going to come? All of a sudden, boop, 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 fruit's out. And then that season sort of passes. And then there has to be maybe another time of taking more in and, and allowing the Lord to prune in our lives and to do things to, to help us to grow. And then the next season, we got even more fruit. Boom, 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 boom. It just works naturally. It's supernaturally natural. But the important thing is hanging out with Jesus and, I, and how we're hearing the Word of God. And it says here, uh, one, one thing to note about this is that Sometimes people say, well, well, the first few conditions of the soil, that's not Christians. That's unbelievers. Christians are the ones who, the good fruit, the, the good soil where the fruit grows. And yeah, that's true. But a Christian can find themselves in any one of these heart conditions too. You can be going through something in your life and have a really hard heart towards the Lord. And that every time you go to church and you just don't even listen, you tune out. You're upset, you're mad at God, and then Satan's just coming and he's just feasting on those seeds all day long, not letting you get anything. Other times we might have so much things going on in our lives, even in ministry. When we've been involved in ministry in, in Houston, there was times where we had so much going on that like I, we're doing the work of ministry, telling people all the right things, but personally in my own life, the, the Word of God's getting choked out because we're so busy doing ministry. That shouldn't happen either, but it does. Right? Sometimes it falls on that rocky soil. You get a little excited about something, and then it kind of just fizzles out. Yeah, that sounded great, but no, I don't know anymore. So we can find ourselves in any one of these conditions. How do we stay in the appropriate condition where, where fruit is growing, where we're having to do the constant weeding and feeding always, but where that fruit is growing, it's on the good soil. It's just by spending time with Jesus, by hanging out with Him, abiding in the vine. And it goes on to say here that Jesus says, No one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Therefore, so in light of that, take heed what, how you hear, for, whatever, for whoever has, to him more will be given, and whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken away from him. So again, how did you hear? If you're hearing correctly, your light should be shining. People should notice they should see that. There should be something different. You don't, you don't hear and glean all these things to then hide them, never talk about them, never say anything. 
Right? That's Jesus said, you don't, you don't get a lamp and then put on a, cover it up and then hide it under the table. What's the purpose of the lamp? That you put it in a room and it lights up the room so that everybody who walks in can see it. Right? Same should be true in our lives. How are you hearing the Word of God? What's it doing in your life? Is it shining? Is it evident? Or is it not? So Jesus, again, He says, take heed how you hear. And it's all, this, this whole chapter is about the Word of God. For whoever does not have, I mean, sorry, for whoever has, to him more will be given. So if you're, if you're doing what we're talking about, God's going to keep revealing. He's going to keep giving you more. He's going to give you more understanding of His Word. I don't know about you, but the longer I'm a Christian and the more that I read the Word and the more that I seek Him, I keep understanding more. I keep getting more out of it. I've read and taught through this gospel a bunch of times, but even now as I'm studying and teaching it again, I'm getting more out of it. And he gives more. But if you're doing the opposite, if you're, if you're letting the cares of life choke out and all these different things, then even what you kind of understood, what you knew, you, know, you lose it. You forget until you get reminded. And so we want to be in that condition of the one who is hearing with ears to hear, who has a soft heart, who's letting the seed of the Word of God fall on that so that it will take root and it will grow up and it will bear fruit in our lives. And then that, that fruit and that that's bearing in our lives, it now is available for others. It's Others are seeing, others are eating, others are, right? I mean, if you think about a fruit tree, if you have a well-producing apple tree in your backyard, there's going to be way more apples than you can eat by yourself. You can give them to your neighbors. You know, we've got some people at church that grow zucchini and things in their backyard, and they get these monster zucchinis, and they bring them to church because they've got too many. They, they can't handle them all themselves. You give them away. And that, that's what happens in our lives is we're letting the Word of God permeate, and it's growing, and the fruit's popping out, and then we have stuff to give out to others and to share the Word of God and to affect others' lives, that the light is shining. And so that's what we want to be. That's the condition that we want to be in. So we have to take heed how we hear. We have, to, we have to hear what God is saying. And again, back to what I said early on, is that you read something and you're not sure what it's all about, just pray. Say, God, what does this mean to me? Even if you do understand what it's about, so what does this mean to me? What am I supposed to do with this information? And He'll show you. He's faithful. And so let's do that, huh? And so let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time in your word. Thank you to desire to teach us and that you desire for us to bear fruit. And you've made it so simple to just hang out with you that we will bear fruit. Help us not to overcomplicate that. Help us not to make it a difficult thing, but to just do what you say and to hang out with you. And so I pray that you would just bless uh, the rest of the evening, the rest of this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.